Today's shooting was bad enough. It's being made worse by others who see it as a chance to make further threats, terrifying all of us. In this case, Congressman Claudia Tenney, she represents New York. Shortly after today's shooting, she received a threat via email. It said this, one down, 216 to go. Our own lives are forfeit, the threat continued. Good riddance to you. Congresswoman Tenney joins us tonight. Congresswoman, um, do you receive threats like this regularly? Actually, I've been receiving them all years. I was newly elected. Uh, I've been getting them ever since the discussions on the American Health Care Act have come up in a number of issues, the tax reform, all those things that we desperately need in New York State. And I've received them regularly, but until now, uh, most of the media, and I have to say the mainstream media, has responded with, well, when are you going to do your town hall? When are, you gonna, when are we going to get a chance to have all these people ambush you at a town hall in a Jerry Springer style atmosphere? And, right. and so now, all of a sudden, everyone's concerned, and all of a sudden, they're not asking me, when are you going to stand up and put yourself on the line at a town hall? So I so think it's very interesting. You've been around politics for a while in New York State. Has, yes. it, has it changed? I mean, the level of threats that you're getting, your colleagues are getting, is it accelerated? Actually, when I was a member of the state assembly, I used to get death threats, but that's because I called on the resignation of some of the most powerful people, like the governor and Sheldon Silver and numerous others. So you were vindicated um, I, by history on that one, by the way. Yeah, I just uh, I've had a, I've had them against me, but to this point, I mean, honestly. Uh, I remember being a college student, and I remember being horrified at the way they treated Ronald Reagan, who was the first president I ever voted for, and thinking everything was Bush's fault. And now I've seen, uh, I've never seen anything like this in my life, and yeah. I've been around a while. I, I just, this, the level of violence, the, the normalization of this violence and this rhetoric uh, as if it's okay. And uh, my district is, uh, you know, beautiful, bucolic, upstate New York. But I also have 11 colleges in my district. Um, one of them being, uh, you know, a, a place where uh, some people who are involved in some kind of in, with violent past are there. So, uh, Susan Rosenberg, former Weather Underground, yeah, of course. Uh, she was invited to speak at Hamilton College, which is where my law practice was located. Uh, they recently, uh, Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn were invited in by a group to speak to the resist movement and the Invis indivisible movement, which are being backed by the Democratic Party. At so Hamilton? Uh, not at Hamilton, but in Utica, New York, which is yeah. the neighboring town. So these kinds of people have been uh, re-earthed, actually, and, and from the 60s. You know, former people who were involved in a violent movement are, are back. And, and I don't think these people are actually Democrats. I think they're people on a, from another realm. So I think, I, think you're, I think the last two points are really smart. This, this yeah. whole moment feels like the 60s redux. Yeah. Congresswoman, thank you for that. Thanks for telling us. Thank you. I greatly your appreciate experience. it. Thank you. With so many members of Congress gathered for today's practice, should there have been stronger security around them? What should security around members of Congress be like henceforth? We're joined tonight by former Secret Service agent Dan Bongino, who's thought a lot about this. So, Dan, 435 members of Congress, probably not feasible to assign each one a bodyguard. What do you do? Yeah, Tucker, you have, well, and if you factor in the Senate, you have 535 right. members. And when I was a Secret Service agent, one of the assets we had was our limited portfolio protectees, the president, the vice president, and their families generally. It only really got busy during the United Nations General Assembly when all the foreign heads of state came in. 535 members, 24-hour coverage, it's, it's, it's a logistic uh, nightmare right now. You'd be talking about expanding the Capitol Police Force by a factor of possibly 20, and I, I don't see it being logistically possible right now. So, uh, and I don't, I don't think it is, and the budget for that would be, of right. course, just stupendous, and it's not physically right. large enough to handle all those people. So yeah. how realistically do you protect people in a job that seems like it's a lot more hazardous than it used to be? Well, good question. I'm glad you asked, because there is a solution here. I hate to present problems and not give people a potential solution. Yeah. One of the assets we have, in contrast to the Secret Service with the President, who's located in the White House, is members of Congress work out of their districts and they work out of D.C. Matter of fact, roughly half and half, depending on uh, you know, what the work schedule looks like. I think there's going to be some better coordination in the future with the Capitol Police and the locals, and they're already doing a good job now. I'm not in any way taking a shot at them. But given this incident between local sheriffs and local police departments in an effort to provide a little bit more coverage, especially if people like the representative you just had on get viable threats. You may have New York State police, right. uh, you know, local sheriffs who will cover them, and that seems to make a lot of sense. It's a no, more balanced approach. I mean, the sad irony of all this is there were, there were only Capitol Hill police there because a member of leadership 
Steve Scalise was there, and he was the only member who was shot. Yeah, Tucker, and, and you know, having been an agent where we never travel with the president with anything less than a, uh, a cadre of agents, right. five and six times as large as what you saw today, you know, God bless these two Capitol Police officers. I mean, they were up against some, a, a person intent on doing severe damage who didn't care about clearly losing his own life. He was intent on killing others. And I, I'm really stunned that, and, and happily stunned, that the, the, there, was no, there wasn't a more serious loss of life here. This could have been, when Rand Paul said today, this could have been a massacre, that was not a hyperbolic statement at all. This could have been the worst political massacre in U.S. history if those Capitol Police officers hadn't stopped this maniac when they did. And, and one of them injured in the process. Yeah, one of them shot in the process at return fire. And I, I think what they're going to have to look at is a more holistic approach here, where if there's a group of members, even if they're not in leadership anywhere out there, that they're going to have to get a more you know, robust security presence. And again, I'm not blaming them. They have limited resources. It's not their fault. It just is what it is. And that going forward, they may have to look at a more umbrella approach to this rather than, than dedicating the assets simply to leadership. Uh, and yeah. that may not be the most effective approach anymore. I hate to think any of this is necessary, but obviously it is. Dan, thank you. Yes, sir. Good to see You're you. You're very welcome.